Welcome back to Pristress Concrete Structures. This is the seventh lecture in the module one on introduction, pristressing systems and material properties. In this lecture, we shall study about pristressing steel. We shall learn the forms of pristressing steel, the types of the steel, the properties of pristressing steel, the stress strain curves relaxation of steel, durability, fatigue and at the end we shall summarize the codal provisions related with the pre-stressing steel. The development of pre-stressed concrete was influenced by the invention of high strength steel. It is an alloy of iron, carbon, manganese and optional materials. Now, as we learned earlier that during the early stages of the pre-stressing concrete, it was noticed that the effective pre-stress reduced with time and the reason was the creep and shrinkage of concrete. In order to overcome this problem, the high strength steel was developed and the pre-stressing of concrete became successful only after the development of the high strength steel. Now in this particular module, we shall discuss about the properties of the pre-stressing steel. We are not covering the properties of conventional non pre stress reinforcement because it is expected that the students of this course are familiar with those properties. the forms of pre-stressing steel. The pre-stressing steel comes in different forms. The first one is the wares. A pre-stressing ware is a single unit made up of steel. The nominal diameters of the wares can be 2.5, 3, 4, 5, 7 or 8 millimeters. Now the ware is the smallest single pre-stressing steel. There can be two types of wares. One is the plain ware, where there is no indentation on the surface. Indentation refers to the depressions on the surface. The other type of wares can be indented. That means there can be circular or elliptical indentations on the surface. These indentations help in the bond between the pre-stressing steel and the grout. The next form of the pre-stressing steel is the strands. Here a few wares are spun together in a helical form to form a pre-stressing stand. There can be different types of strand. The first one is a two wire strand. Here these two wares are spun together they will form a helix after the spunning process. The second type is the three wire strand where the strand consists of three wires spun together and the third is the seven wire strand where the central wire which is slightly larger than the other six wires and the six wires are spun around the central wire in this type of strand. Next 
we can also have the pre-stressing still in the form of a tendon. A group of strands or wires are wound to form a pre-stressing tendon. Now, in this sketch of the cross section of a tendon, we see that several strands have been inserted within a duct and the duct has been filled up with grout. Now, this whole assembly or this whole unit is called a tendon. Next, a cable is a group of tendons. Now, there can be different groups of tendons to form a cable. And finally, we come to the bars. A tendon can be made up of a single bar where the diameter of a bar is much larger than that of a wire. The bars are available in the sizes of 10, 12, 16, 20, 22, 25, 28 and 32 millimeters. In these figures, you can understand the difference. In the top left, we have a 7 wire strand which can itself be a tendon and the bottom left is a single bar tendon. Here is just one unit which forms the tendon. On the bottom right is a multi wire tendon where several wires form the tendon and at the top right we can see how the tendons are attached in a post tensioned member through the help of the anchorage system. Next, we are moving on to the types of the pre-stressing steel. The pre-stressing steel is treated to achieve the desired property. Now, if there is no other special treatment, then the steel is called as drawn or untreated steel. But the following are some special treatments which enhances the properties of the pre-stressing steel. The first treatment process is cold working or cold drawing. This process is done by rolling the bars through a series of dies. It realigns the crystals and increases the strength. That means the cold working of a bar is done to increase the strength of the wear which was earlier having less strength as compared to what it achieves after the cold working process. The second treatment process is stress relieving. In this process, the strands are heated to about 350 degrees centigrade and then they are cooled slowly. This enhances the stress strain curve of the concrete and we shall see this enhancement in a later slide. The third type of treatment is the strain tampering for low relaxation. In this process, the heating of the strand to about 350 degrees Celsius is done under tension. The resultant stress strain curve is better and also the relaxation observed in this type of steel is lower than the steel which is untreated. Now, IS 1343 specifies the material properties of the pre-stressing steel in section 4.5. Now, the following types of steel are allowed. The first type is the plain cold drawn stress relieved wear conforming to IS 1785 part 1. The second is the plain as drawn wear without any treatment conforming to IS 1785 part 2. Third is the indented cold drawn wear conforming to IS 6003. Fourth is the high tensile steel bars conforming to IS 2090 and the fifth is the uncoated stress relief strand conforming to IS 
6006. All these codes specify the properties of these different types of strands. They also specify the testing procedure, the sampling procedure and the nomenclature used in the different types of steel. We are not going into the details of this individual codes, but we shall refer to the main properties from these codes. Properties of pre-stressing steel. Now, as I mentioned before that the pre-stressing steel is different from a conventional non-pre-stressed reinforcement by several factors. The first one is that the pre-stressing steel has to be of high strength. Unless we have high strength, the initial pre-stressing strain will not be large and in that case there will be substantial loss over time due to the creep and shrinkage of concrete. Hence, the high strength is a primary requirement of the pre-stressing steel. The second is adequate ductility. In case of vibrating loads, this property becomes essential. Third, bendability, required at harping points and at ends. The pre-stressing steel needs to be bent around the harping points or the hold down points and also they are bent close to the ends because they change in direction at the anchorage blocks. Hence bendability is a requirement for the pre-stressing tendons. Fourth, high bond required for pretension members. In our lecture in pretension member, I had mentioned that the transfer of stress from the pre-stressing steel to the concrete takes by bond and hence the bond is a very important requirement for the tendons used in pre-tensioned members. Now in post-tension members also, if there is good bond between the pre-stressing steel and the grout, then the stress transfer is better along the length. The fifth important property is low relaxation to reduce losses. Now this concept of relaxation we shall cover in this course and it is desired that the pre-stressing steel should have low relaxation and hence the sometimes the steel is treated to have this desirable property. And finally the steel should have minimum corrosion. Although there is an alkaline environment around the steel, it is always preferred to have a steel which is less susceptible to corrosion. Next we are coming to the first and the foremost important property of pre-stressing steel that is the strength of pre-stressing steel. The tensile strength of pre-stressing steel is given in terms of the characteristic tensile strength which is denoted by the term FPK. The characteristic strength is defined as the ultimate tensile strength of the coupon specimens below which not more than 5 percent of the test results are expected to fall. In the lecture on the material properties of concrete, we learned that the definition of characteristic strength is based on a probability distribution of the test results of several numbers of specimens. A normal distribution is assumed and the characteristic strength is defined as the value below which not more than 5 percent of the test results are expected to fall. Now, the ultimate tensile strength of a coupon specimen is determined by a testing machine as per the code IS 1521. Now, the following figure shows such a test setup. In this figure, a coupon specimen has been gripped at the two ends. This gripping has been possible by the wedge action at the top and at the bottom. Now, this testing machine applies the load on the wedges and which is then transferred to the coupon specimen. 
The elongation of the coupon specimen is measured by the extensometer and when we plot the load versus extension from there we can get the stress versus strain curve of the pre-stressing stand. The strength is calculated from the failure load at which the first wear in the strand snaps. The deformation can also be measured by linear variable differential transducers or in short LVTTs. Now after the testing of the specimen we can see how the specimen has ruptured. The individual wires in the strands have come separated and this is the failure state of the coupon specimen. Now the IS codes for the individual types of wires and strands specify some minimum tensile strength for each type of wear. First in IS 1785 in part 1 for the coal drawn stress relief wares we see that for a diameter of 2.5 millimeters that minimum tensile strength is 2010 Newton per millimeter square. For 3 millimeter diameters it is 1865 and like that for a wear of 8 millimeters diameters the strength is 1375 Newton per millimeter square. Now all these values are much higher than the conventional steel that is used in reinforced concrete. In reinforced concrete the tensile ill stress is around 250 or 415 or 500 Newton per millimeter square. Now compared to that you can observe that the tensile strength in this type of wares is much higher. The proof stress which we shall define later should not be less than 85 percent of the specified tensile strength. The second table is from IS 1785 part 2. This table is for as drawn wares for a diameter of 3 millimeters the tensile strength is 1765. It can be noted that this value is less than the previous value for a cold drawn wear. That means a cold drawn process increases the tensile strength of the wares. Similarly values are specified for the 4 and 5 millimeter diameter wares. Here the proof stress should not be less than 75 percent of the specified tensile strength. We can observe that the specification for proof stress is lower for as drawn wares as compared to the cold drawn wares. The third table is for indented wares according to IS 6003. The tensile strength for a 3 millimeter diameter is 1865 Newton per millimeter square and similar values are given for wares of diameters 4 and 5 millimeters. The proof stress should not be less than 85 percent of the specified tensile strength. Now these values are similar to the cold drawn wares that we have seen in the first table. For high tensile steel bars as per code IS 2090 the minimum tensile strength is 980 Newton per millimeter square. We can observe that this value is much lower than the individual wares which are shown in the previous three tables. That means if we use a steel bar as a pre-stressing tendon its tensile strength is much less but the benefit we may get is the anchorage becomes simpler and we have to deal with just one bar instead of a group of wares. 
the proof stress for a bar should not be less than 80 percent of the specified tensile strength. Next we are moving on to the stiffness of pre stressing steel. The stiffness of pre stressing steel is given by the initial modulus of elasticity. The modulus of elasticity depends not only on the grade of steel, but also on the type of application like wares or strands or bars. Remember that in strands there it is there is not just a single wear, it is a cluster of wares which is spun together. Now, when we are testing this strand, the modulus can be different from the modulus of the individual wares. Now, IS 1343 1980 provides some guidelines which can be used in absence of test data. For cold drawn wares, the modulus of elasticity is 210 kilonewton per millimeter square. For high tensile steel bars, it can be taken as 200 kilonewton per millimeter square and for strands, it is 195 kilonewton per millimeter square. We can observe that for the strands, the modulus is lower as compared to the wares because a strand is formed of several wares and hence if we test a strand, the modulus is found to be less than that of an individual wear. Now, based on the strength of the steel, allowable stresses have been specified in the code which should be maintained during the pre-stressing process. As per clause 18.5.1, the maximum tensile stress during pre-stressing which we are denoting as FPI shall not exceed 80 percent of the characteristic strength. That means, during the pre-stressing process, we have to make sure that the tensile stress that we are applying on the tendons is limited within 80 percent of the characteristic tensile strength. Now, I had told earlier that the pre-stressing process is a difficult process and we have to take adequate safety measures during the pre-stressing operation. And this limit is a safety measure so that the wear does not snap during the pre-stressing process. The code 1343 does not specify any upper limit for the stress at transfer which is after the short term losses or for the effective pre-stress which is after the long term losses. But in some of the international codes, there can be specifications for these two values of the stresses. Next, we are moving on to the stress strain curves of pre-stressing steel. We need the stress strain curves of pre-stressing steel to study the behavior of a pre-stressing member. Now, the stress versus strain curve under uniaxial tension is initially linear. That means, the stress is proportional to strain and we can apply the Hooke's law. And it is also elastic. That means, the strain is recovered at unloading. But beyond about 70 percent of the ultimate strength, the behavior becomes nonlinear and inelastic. That means, if we stretch the bar beyond 70 percent of the ultimate strength, then the stress strain curve is no more linear. That means, stress is not proportional to strain anymore. And also, we see some inelastic or plastic deformation in the steel. Now, for pre stressing steel, unlike the conventional reinforcement, mild steel reinforcement, there is no specific ill point. That means, we do not have any plateau in the stress strain curve of the pre stressing steel. Now, then how do we define the ill point for our design purpose? The ill point is defined in terms of the proof stress 
or a specified yield strain. Now, IS 1343 recommends the yield point at 0.2 percent proof stress. The 0.2 percent proof stress is defined as the stress corresponding to an inelastic strain of 0 0.002. From this graph, we can understand that initially the stress versus strain is linear and then it becomes nonlinear with the increase in stress. Now, the proof stress is that particular value of the stress which corresponds to a plastic deformation of 0 0.002. Now, in order to get the proof stress, we draw a line which is parallel to the initial part of the curve and wherever this line intercepts the stress strain curve, we pick up that point and the stress corresponding to that point is the proof stress. The purpose of drawing a line parallel to the initial slope is that we are considering a point which is having a plastic deformation of 0 0.002. In some other international codes, the yield point is defined corresponding to a specified yield strain. Now, the stress strain curve for different types of pre-stressing steel are given in the figure 5 of IS 1343. In case if we need the stress corresponding to a strain in our calculations, we can use these curves. On the left side, the curve is for stress relieved wares, strands and bars. Here the curve is specified in terms of stresses corresponding to different amounts of plastic strain. So, for this particular curve on the left, the value of the stress for a plastic strain of 0 0.002 is 90 percent of the characteristic strength. The stress corresponding to a plastic strain of 0 0.005 is 95 percent of the characteristic strength. Whereas, on the right hand side, the curve is for an as drawn wear. Here, you can see that the stress corresponding to a plastic strain of 0 0.002 is lower and it is given as 85 percent of the characteristic strength. Whereas, the plastic strain of 0 0.005 has a stress which is almost same as that of the other curve. That means, the main difference between the as drawn and the stress relieved wares is the variation of the stress strain curve near this yielding region. Let us now try to understand the effect of the different treatment process that processes that we have learned earlier. Now, in this figure, we see that the main variation comes in this particular region where the bars start to yielding. If we have an as drawn wear or an untreated wear, then the variation from the elastic to the plastic region is quite gradual. If we treat this wear to a stress relieved wear, then we see that this variation is relatively reduced. That means, at this transition, the stress relief wares have higher stress compared to the as drawn wares. And then finally, if we do a low relaxation treatment process, then we have a sharper kink. And here also we find that the stress is higher as compared to as drawn and stress relieved. That means, after the treatment process, we gain in a higher elastic behavior and then the yielding occurs relatively sharply and by this we achieve a better behavior of the stress strain curve in a low relaxation or stress relieved wares as compared to the as drawn wares. 
Now from the characteristic strength, we can define the design stress strain curve. The design stress strain curves are calculated by dividing the stress beyond 0.8 FPK by a material safety factor of gamma m is equal to 1.15. If we compare the design stress strain curve of concrete with respect to the characteristic curve with that of the design curve of steel with respect to the characteristic curve, we can see that the material safety factor in steel is applied only after a certain amount of stress. The reason is it has been observed that the variation of the modulus of the steel does not change much for the different grades of steel. Hence, any variability in the strength is not reflected in the modulus of the steel and that is why the material safety factor is incorporated only in the strength and it has not been incorporated in the initial modulus. Whereas for concrete, the variation of strength also shows a variation in the initial modulus and hence in concrete, the partial safety factor is used throughout the stress strain curve wherein a curve of lower strength will also have a lower elastic moduli. Another difference is the value of the material safety factor. In concrete, the value is 1.5 since the variability is high, whereas for the pre-stressing steel, the value of the material safety factor is 1.15 which is lower than that of the concrete. Next, we are moving on to another important property of steel that is the relaxation of steel. The relaxation of steel is defined as the decrease in stress with time under constant strain. Due to the relaxation of steel, the pre-stress in the tendon is reduced with time. Hence, the study of relaxation is important in pre-stress concrete to calculate the loss in pre-stress. Earlier in the study of the material properties of concrete, we had studied creep and shrinkage and we understood that these phenomena are very important to be studied for pre-stress concrete because they lead to the loss of pre-stress over time. And similarly, the relaxation is also an important property which needs to be studied because it also has the same effect of the reduction of pre-stress over time. Now the relaxation of steel depends on the type of steel, the amount of initial pre-stress and the temperature to which the steel is subjected. Now this curve shows the relaxation process. If we are testing a coupon specimen quickly, then we shall achieve this top curve, but if we are sustaining the load at a certain point and then what we shall observe is that if we are maintaining the strain, then the stress carried by the coupon specimen gets reduced. That means the drop in stress with time for a constant strain is defined as the relaxation. That means the shift of the curve along the stress axis under sustained load is defined as relaxation. Now this figure shows the variation of stress with time for different levels of pre-stressing. If the initial pre-stressing is about 60 percent of the characteristic strength, then the drop of the pre-stressing due to relaxation is much lower. But if we increase the initial pre-stressing to say 70 percent, 
80% or 90% of the characteristic strength, then we see that the drop in pre-stress with time gets substantial. This is another reason why the code limits the value of the initial pre-stress to 80% of the characteristic strength, so that the relaxation loss is relatively limited. Now note that here the time axis is a logarithmic axis and most of these relaxation tests are done for a time of 1000 hours or if it is not possible to do for 1000 hours then the tests are done for a time of 100 hours. Now it can be observed that there is significant relaxation loss when the applied stress is more than 70 percent of the characteristic tensile strength. That means we have to be aware that if we are stretching the tendons beyond 70 percent of the characteristic strength, we shall see significant relaxation loss and hence we have to include that in our calculation of the effective pre-stress after several years. <coughs> Now this photograph shows the determination of a relaxation loss for a particular type of steel. Here the coupon specimen has been held between two grips and a certain amount of load has been applied on the specimen and then the grips are maintained at a particular distance that means the strain in the specimen has been maintained constant. The drop in the stress is recorded by this load cell and this whole assembly has been placed in a chamber with constant temperature. As I said that the relaxation loss depends on the initial pre-stress, it depends on the temperature and hence in a standard test both these values are specified so that we are able to compare the relaxation loss for the different types of steel. Now in this particular photograph a single wear is being tested for the relaxation loss. In this sketch it is a similar type of setup where a strand is being tested for the relaxation loss. Now the code specifies some upper limits for the relaxation loss. For a cold drawn stress relief wear, for indented wares and for stress relief strand, the maximum amount of relaxation loss after 1000 hours is 5 percent of the initial pre-stress. For bars, the relaxation loss after 1000 hours can be maximum up to 49 Newton per millimeter square. Now as pre-stressing steel has to be of better quality as corresponding to, to reinforcement steel, the steel before any construction should be subjected to the tests specified in the code and the designer should check those test results before approving the construction of the structure. The material testing is a very important aspect of precast, pre-stressed concrete construction. Now when we are doing some design calculations, if we do not have any test data, then the code allows us to use the following table to calculate the relaxation losses. Depending upon the initial stress, we can calculate the relaxation loss and these values are as follows. If the initial stress is about 50 percent of the characteristic strength, then we did not have to consider any relaxation loss. If the initial stress is 60 percent, then the relaxation loss is 35 Newton per millimeter square. Similarly, if the 
initial stresses are 70 percent or 80 percent of the characteristic strength and then the relaxation losses are 70 and 90 Newton per millimeter square respectively. And we can observe that with the increase in the initial stress the relaxation losses are also increasing. The next property that we shall study is the fatigue. Now the fatigue is a concern under repeated load or even reverse load. Under repeated dynamic loads, the strength of a member may reduce with the number of cycles of applied load. The reduction in strength is referred to as fatigue. The fatigue is a concern in structures like bridges or any other structural element which is subjected to vibration. Now, in priesthood applications, the fatigue is negligible in members that do not crack under service loads. But if a member cracks, fatigue may be a concern due to high stress in the steel at the locations of the cracks. Earlier, we had said that we can design the priestess members as one of the three types. In type 1, no tensile stress is allowed in the pre-stress member. In type 2, tensile stresses are allowed, but no cracking is allowed. In type 3, tensile stresses and cracking is allowed, but the cracking is limited to a certain value or the crack width is limited. Hence, the fatigue becomes a concern for the type 3 members. If we are designing the structure as type 1 and type 2 for the service loads, then we may not check for the fatigue. Now, the, for the fatigue testing, the specimens are tested under 2 million cycles of the load. For steel, the fatigue tests are conducted to develop the stress versus number of cycles for failure diagram. The SN curve is an important characteristic behavior to study the effect of fatigue. The SN curve is a plot of the stress versus the number of cycles which leads to failure. Now, under a limiting value of the stress, the specimen can withstand infinite number of cycles and this limit is known as the endurance limit. Let me explain the SN diagram by a sketch. <coughs> Can I have this? The SN curve plots the failure stress corresponding to the number of cycles. What is observed is as the number of cycles increases, the failure stress reduces. But beyond a certain value, beyond a value of 2 million cycles, the failure stress does not reduce. And this value of this stress is called the endurance limit. Thus, if a structure is subjected to repeated loading and if we design the structure in such a way that the stress is within the end endurance limit, then we do not have a problem of fatigue. But if the stress comes above the endurance limit, then we will have a problem of fatigue when the number of corresponding number of cycles is crossed. Usually, the pre-stressed member 
is designed in such a way that the stress in the steel due to the service load remain under the endurance limit. That means the members are designed such that the stresses will not lead to a fatigue problem. Now this photograph shows a fatigue testing of an pre-stressing steel and an anchorage block. Here the pulsating load is applied by these two jacks and there is a beam at the bottom and there is a reaction beam at the top. As the jacks are moving down, as the pistons are moving down, the bottom beam is moving down and it is applying tension to the steel and this load is being varied over several cycles to study the fatigue behavior of the pre-stressing steel and the anchorage block. As I said that usually the tests are done for 2 million cycles to check that the pre-stressing steel and the anchorage block is satisfactory to sustain this repeated loading. Next we are moving on to the durability of pre-stressing steel. The pre-stressing steel is susceptible to stress corrosion and hydrogen embrittlement in aggressive environments. Hence the pre-stressing steel needs to be adequately protected. Compared to reinforcement by conventional steel, the pre-stressing steel is subjected to much higher stress and this leads to some durability problems which are termed as stress corrosion and hydrogen embrittlement. These two types of durability problems are more possible in aggressive environments. Hence, we need to check any corrosion problem of the pre-stressing steel and as I mentioned earlier that the amount of pre-stressing steel is usually much lower than the amount of conventional reinforcement. Hence, any corrosion of the pre-stressing steel is more dangerous as compared to the reinforcement steel. The reduction of the diameter of a pre-stressing tendon will lead to a more problem because the proportional reduction is higher as compared to the same amount of reduction for a reinforcement steel. For bonded tendons, the alkaline environment of the grout provides adequate protection. That means in pretension members or in post-tension members where the grouting has been done properly, the grout itself provides an alkaline environment around the pre-stressing steel which protects the steel from corrosion. But if we are using unbonded pre-stressing tendons in post-tension members, then we have to be careful about the corrosion problems and several corrosion protection measures are taken. They can be one of the following. We can coat the pre-stressing tendons with epoxy and those type of tendons of course have reduced uh, bond and hence if we are using epoxy coated steel for pretension members, then we have to be careful that the stress transfer will be reduced. The second protection measure is by wrapping the pre-stressing steel by some mastic tape. These mastic tapes are grease impregnated tapes which protect the steel from any corrosion coming from acidic environment. We can use galvanized bars as the pre-stressing tendons, but the cost of galvanized bars is substantially higher than conventional pre-stressing steel. Or we can also use some tubes to encase the unbonded tendons within the duct itself. That means since the ducts are not grouted, the pre-stressing steel are susceptible to corrosion 
to avoid corrosion we are either using some epoxy coating or we are covering it by some mastic wrap or we are encasing them in tubes or we may use galvanized bars to check that corrosion. There are several other provisions in 1343 regarding the handling of pre-stressing steel. Those provisions are not being reproduced here because those are self-explanatory and it is expected that you get familiar with those provisions. The assembly of pre-stressing and reinforcing steel is explained in section 11. Since the pre-stressing operation is a difficult operation, it needs skilled personnel to perform this operation and hence the code specifies some specific provisions to do this pre-stressing process. The specifications for pre-stressing is covered under section 12 of the code. This today we covered the material properties of pre-stressing steel. As I said that the pre-stressed concrete became successful only after the invention of high strength steel because if we use conventional steel then the loss of pre-stress will be substantially high as compared to the initial pre-stress that can be allowed and hence the effective pre-stress will be almost negligible. If you are having high strength steel then the initial strain and the initial pre-stress are substantially high and then even after the losses the effective pre-stress will be substantial and hence the pre-stressed concrete member will be successful to carry the service loads. First we discuss the different forms of pre-stressing steel. We say that the pre-stressing steel can be in the form of a wear which is an individual unit. The different wear diameters are specified in the code. The wares can be plain wares or indented wares. The indented wares have some depressions on the surface. Next we moved on to the strands. The strands are made up of several wares spun together in a helical form. It can be a 2 wear strand, a 3 wear strand or a 7 wear strand. Several strands can be grouped together to form a tendon. The strands are placed in a duct and the duct is grouted in a post tension member to form a tendon. Now several tendons can be grouped together to form a pre-stressing cable. Sometimes the tendons are made up of individual bars and those individual bars are of much larger diameter and these bars are used because it is easy to anchor them in the concrete. Next we moved on to the different types of pre-stressing steel. We learned that if the pre-stressing steel is untreated or as drawn then the stress strain behavior may not be satisfactory. Hence some treatment processes are undertaken to enhance the strength or the stress strain behavior. In cold working the strength is increased. In the stress relieving process or in the low relaxation steel the stress strain behavior is enhanced where the curve at the ill region is higher than the curve corresponding to an as drawn wear. Next we moved on to the properties of pre-stressing steel. The first property that we studied was the strength because that is the most important property of the pre-stressing steel. Thus minimum strength requirements for the different types of pre-stressing steel are given in the different codes. For the wares we have found that the characteristic strengths are much higher compared to the characteristic strengths of conventional 
reinforcing bars. For a single bar pre-stressing tendon, the tensile strength is lower than that of the wires, but still that is much higher compared to a conventional reinforcement. The tensile strength can be obtained by tests performed in testing machines wherein the coupon specimen are hold between two grips and the deformation is measured by extensiometers or LVDTs and the tensile strength is calculated from the load at failure. We also learned about the stiffness of pre-stressing steel which is measured by the elastic modulus. We have seen that the elastic modulus of strand is lower than that of the individual wires because of the wires in a strand are spun together. The code gives us some guidelines for the elastic modulus in absence of any test data. Next we moved on to the stress strain curve of pre-stressing steel and we have found that unlike conventional reinforcement of mild steel, the pre-stressing steel does not have any yield plateau. The code gives us some characteristic curves from which we can calculate the stress corresponding to a strain. We learned the definition of proof stress that a 0.2 percent proof stress is the stress corresponding to a plastic deformation of 0 0.002 and the code specifies a minimum proof stress for the different types of steel. Next we moved on to the important property of steel which is the relaxation. The study of relaxation is important because it helps us to calculate the loss of pre-stress over time. The relaxation of steel depends on the initial pre-stress, it depends on the type of steel and also on the temperature. What we have found that if the initial pre-stress is substantially high say beyond 70 percent of the characteristic strength then the relaxation losses can be substantial. Hence the code limits us the initial pre-stress to about 80 percent of the characteristic strength. One for the safety reasons and second that the relaxation loss should be limited. The code specifies the maximum amount of relaxation loss for different types of steel. In our design calculations if we need the relaxation loss then the code gives us some lump sum values which are independent of time. If we need more detailed calculations then we have to look into the international codes. We also looked into the durability and fatigue of the pre-stressing steel. Both of these can be important under the specific situations. Hence depending on the case we have to study them in details. In our next class we shall move on to the calculation of losses of the pre-stressed concrete. Thank you.